Sime. All right, it is time for the Austrian Grand Prix observations. This is a delayed observations. I had some technical issues. If you hear, I don't know, a jet taking off, then <laughs> if you hear a jet taking off, then I don't know. That's my that's my fan. That's my PC fan going crazy. But anyway, so during the Austrian Grand Prix weekend, it was a sprint weekend. Um, we got to see the Orange Army get humbled. <laughs> we'll get to that later on in the in the observations. Likewise, a whole lot of uh, ire being directed towards the stewards. But anyway, let's get into it. So first off, uh, my thoughts on sprint weekends. I kind of believe this is where this is the, the peak of sprint of sprint weekends. I don't see them functioning as the <laughs> traditional format for Grand Prix weekends. Uh, why is that? In an attempt to make um, the weekend more compelling, <laughs> uh, they've actually managed to make it uh, a little less compelling. And because they've tried to, um, because they've tried to d make the, the, the sprint race more valuable with, with the greater points haul, um, uh, it serves as a bit of a neutralizer for, uh, well, depending how results actually pan out, but it can otherwise serve as well, a bit of a softener if over a full race distance you don't actually uh, beat, beat your competitor. <laughs> but anyway, uh, someone's going to say, um, oh, but Sir Lewis Hamilton put on his sterling drive. Uh, in Brazil, yeah, that happened. I still don't like sprint weekends. I mean, <laughs> I still don't like them. They just, they just, um, you know, qualifying is on Friday. The weekend's already begun. There's functionally, you haven't even had time to settle into it or anything. It's just boom, here we go. Something important has happened. It's qualifying on Friday. <laughs> bizarre. It's bizarre. And then there's a race on Saturday that. Uh, <laughs> that decides the grid for the real race on Sunday it's just it's just bad formatting it's just it it's it's a format that is uh, reminiscent of a feeder series but I digress <laughs> and sure we've had some exciting sprint weekends here and there I think it's it's best that if the sprint formats is going to stay then it just stay as a few weekends here and there three weekends four weekends maybe uh, the apparatus implements it as a as a host contract uh, situation you know over five years if you get a five-year contract who knows but over five years you know you have to host a sprint weekend <laughs> you know who knows maybe there'll be sprints only Grand Prix circuits who knows Emily seems to be doing that might be a cheaper contract than to than to have the full traditional weekend ideally Braun and friends cap it to five sprint weekends a season if we're gonna have 20 plus grand prix they should cut down the calendar but that will be a wildly unpopular opinion but if the calendar isn't going to be cut down then sure we can have sprint weekends <laughs> sure we can have them but if they were to be if, if sprint weekends were to be its own formats, I think people would see through the, the ruse quick enough. But anyway, as things are, uh, the sprint weekends have thrown up some, some interesting weekends, some interesting results as well, some interesting uh, performances, and they've otherwise been a boon to the current season. I don't believe they were a boon to previous season, but I digress. All right, seeing as the weekend was a sprint weekend, it started on Friday. <laughs> uh, Mercedes, uh, both both the Mercedes crashed in qualifying. It was uh, caused quite a stir. I'm actually <laughs> I'm actually glad that both of them crashed uh, instead of just Sir Lewis Hamilton crashing because well. Well, the F1 Weber Sphere would have um, been ablaze <laughs> for very different reasons. 
and for very foolish and stupid reasons so I'm, I'm actually glad that was um that was averted by both the cars crashing but yeah both the cars crashed it was windy on the friday <laughs> i mean i don't expect the car to be good in, in windy conditions uh, proved to throw two superb drivers off the circuit is what it is uh, they might have a similar problem at Paul Ricard if it just so happens to be windy there. It depends which direction and from where and where on the circuit specifically. But yeah, they might have a similar problem at Paul Ricard. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, Mercedes drove a pretty good recovery. Well, I'll say recovery. It wasn't really a recovery weekend. <laughs> it wasn't really a recovery drive. But. Uh, but given the circumstances, it's best to characterize it as a recovery drive. Uh, likewise, George Russell. That's why I didn't really... <laughs> Aside from Miami, where Sir Lewis himself uh, didn't bother with making the strategy call. <laughs> well, he did make the strategy call. Just wasn't um, It wasn't a, 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 a racing one, but I digress. <laughs> I digress. Mercedes over here, they put George Russell on a, well, quite frankly, a shit strategy. <laughs> was this true? It was a shit strategy. I really, um, it was impressive that he was able to drive through anyway, considering, <laughs> considering the strategy that they put him on for the Grand Prix. Uh, this is the Sunday Grand Prix, that is. I'm not really bothered about addressing uh, the Saturday. Yeah, yeah, baby Schumacher has had his uh, handicap match with Sir Lewis Hamilton calling it a handicap match. Magnussen was there um, <laughs> providing slipstream. Yeah, he's had, he's had his handicap match on the Saturday. It was, it was fun TV. Did I expect that to remain a, <laughs> a race long a narrative on on Sunday no so it didn't pan out to be yeah Mercedes did have to um, well perhaps change whatever their preferred uh, strategy would have been on account of the Haas cars uh, but otherwise it was aside from the Friday crashes it was a pretty <laughs> it was a pretty planned weekend for Mercedes yes so Lewis Hamilton has gotten the podium uh, there's been some good racing all around, or some some really good form. <laughs> I must say, some some really stunning form from the weekend, and a most unorthodox <laughs> overtake from, I believe George Russell also did one of those overtakes. And what turn is that? It's turn four, five, six, seven, and that seven eight complex. But anyway. <laughs> But anyway, I mean, Mercedes, they've driven their weekend. They've gotten perhaps a better result than expected on account of science and Perez DNFing. Uh, but at the end of the day, for me, it's really another unconvincing weekend from from Mercedes. Thankfully, it's Paul Ricard next. Good testing circuit. So it will be interesting to see what their car looks like there. But it was otherwise telling for me that well, they couldn't they couldn't actually get past the horse in short order. It was it wasn't easy getting past that car. It's too slippery in a in a straight line, and I'm sure it doesn't have to be addressed, right? If Perez didn't <laughs> if Perez didn't see red going into turn four in lap one, and likewise if um, if signs if Sainz's power unit didn't decide to, um, well, didn't decide to detonate, <laughs> quite frankly, detonate, it will get to that, then I'm pretty sure Mercedes would have finished the uh, fifth and sixth as per usual, and well, that would be that. But otherwise, poor Ricard, big weekend for Mercedes coming up. Will be interesting to see what they do. All right, next up, after the sprint race, um, Leclerc. <laughs> <laughs> Leclerc was, uh, I believe it was on team radio, but Leclerc, he was uh, very, um, I say very like, 
you can be more convinced than convinced. But he was convinced that uh, they were going to be faster than the Red Bulls on Sunday. Uh, Leclerc was convinced and, well, it bore out. It bore out. And, you know, I, I should probably address um, the very uh, hard racing between the Ferrari boys. Uh, if the team is comfortable with letting them do that, then so be it. I seem to recall a more competent version of this Ferrari outfit not actually letting that happen, but I digress. I digress. A more competent version of this Ferrari outfit would have already uh, put all their eggs in the Charles Leclerc basket, but they're not doing that. They haven't done that. Um, the drivers are still free to race. And yeah, they seem to race very hard. I'm very surprised that well, I would be very surprised if there was if there wasn't a bit of a <laughs> a bit of a stern warning given in house after um, after that sprint race uh, because at some point I thought Leclerc was about to crash <laughs> into some, quite frank quite frankly I thought he, I thought they were about to crash into each other didn't happen good for them but if they're probably allowed to race all year. It's probably going to happen at some <laughs> at some weekend along the way. It will undoubtedly be interesting to see <laughs> how Ferrari responds to that situation. But otherwise, Leclerc he put out he put out the elbows this weekend. He kept signs behind him in the sprint, and he ended up being the tip of the spear. Come Sunday, he ended up getting the victory off the back of that can't really fault him and you know had he asked me before the weekend would I have expected uh, Ferrari to be the strong yes I would have expected Ferrari to be strong at the A1 ring I wouldn't have been able to tell you why though I still can't tell you why but I would have expected that car to be very good at the A1 ring it was very good and I should probably stop calling it the A1 ring or maybe just call it Ostrike ring who knows ah oh, fuck it <laughs> fuck it but yeah, I would have expected the Ferrari to be good coming into um, the Red Bull ring. Let's call it correct now. But I likewise would have expected Verstappen to seal the victory come the end of the weekend. All right, I had the weekend down as Ferrari versus Verstappen. And it did actually pan out that way. <laughs> I should have probably posted the video that I wanted to make, but... Uh, but yeah, considering I had the weekend down as Verstappen versus the Ferraris, it was very telling to me <laughs> that Leclerc uh, let slip that, oh, we'll, we'll definitely have them tomorrow. That was quite telling to me. I'll be very interested to see how this Ferrari does a poor record. Yes, Science has had the, the DNF, his engine quite literally grenaded. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to pop out the bodywork, I swear down. But anyway, his engine grenaded. Uh, it's probably safe to chalk that up to, well, he was following Leclerc, the old Grand Prix. And if he wasn't following Leclerc, also in the sprint, mind you, he was following Verstappen. <laughs> so, so, yeah, this car never really got get clean air, quote unquote. And it seems the engine hit a stress limit as far as heat management goes. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. I mean, it's not fine for Ferrari. It's it's fine for me. Because <laughs> I actually just want them to put all their eggs in the Leclerc basket. Although it does remain to be seen if he actually would have been able to overtake Verstappen. Because, well, Verstappen would have been <laughs> perhaps more stern with signs than with Leclerc. But all things considered, a good weekend from Ferrari. <laughs> I mean, it's on as even, really, considering uh, Verstappen got uh, the eight points in the sprint race. It's essentially on as even. But otherwise, good on Leclerc and good on Ferrari for humbling the Orange Army this weekend. Well, I say this weekend, this past weekend. <laughs> really can't stress enough how <laughs> interested I am to see how this Ferrari looks at Paul Ricard. Really interested. Likewise to see how it looks at Spa and Suzuka, but those are further afield. But I'm very interested to see how this car performs around Paul Ricard. 
why is that because i'm pretty sure whoever has the best car should be finishing one and two at port ricard will that actually happen probably not <laughs> it's probably not this formula is a bit too racy for that so probably not but otherwise i do believe ferrari have a car that's good enough to accomplish that pending reliability but you know everyone seems to be uh <laughs> everyone seems to be a little skint on reliability this season all right so verstappen has fallen short in a home encounter with the prancing horses and it's a home encounter for red bull more so than verstappen well verstappen's home encounters in the dutch grand prix to be specific but otherwise this is a home grand prix well austria was a home grand prix for for red bull and the orange army came out they're dropping flares and what have you <laughs> and he fell short verstappen i shouldn't really it's it's kind of unfair to say verstappen fell short but i mean this is how <laughs> this is how things are judged at the end of the day and why am I saying that? Well, because the car fell short, really. <laughs> That's what really happened at the at the end of the day. Yeah, that car was just never going to challenge Leclerc in the Ferrari. It probably was going to challenge Sainz, but definitely not. <laughs> definitely not Leclerc. Similar to Spain. Right, it's just looked better for red bull because they've been aggressive on their strategy with the undercut so they've come out ahead of leclerc on on two pit stops oh leclerc has to do more overtaking i mean <laughs> i mean uh, i mean it's uh, it's a bit of an indictment on ferrari that they let that happen but uh you know standards are standards are very low at ferrari right now <laughs> Standards are very low for strategy goals at Ferrari right now, but otherwise um, Yeah, Verstappen he fell short in this in this encounter. I actually had him down as winning this Grand Prix um, before Before the weekend got underway Why is that I just expected him to be too too strong? At the A1 ring. I really just expected them to just be too strong at the A1 ring um I did not expect their car to be good. I say that uh, they were going to finish fourth with Perez at worst, but that was just it. I expected both the Ferraris to be ahead of Perez, <laughs> no matter what, no matter how things fell at the end of the day. Things fell particularly bad for Perez, <laughs> and that and that idea panned out to be uh, correct um, in a far different context to what I first thought. But otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, Verstappen's driven the best race he could have driven given the circumstances. And I don't know, could he have overtaken Leclerc when he was having his uh, sticky throttle situation? If, I don't know, if, if, if the race had five more laps on it? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I really don't think so. Leclerc, he was adapting to that anyway. But I really don't think Verstappen was going to challenge Leclerc in any meaningful way aside from well aside from when he was defending the first <laughs> the first bunch of attacks from the clip aside from those but otherwise step and he won the sprint race um second in the actual grand prix on sunday <laughs> what more what more could he possibly ask for right the car wasn't up for a win on sunday but well, you still get a trophy. It's still the best possible trophy you could have gotten with the car not being up for a win. So, likewise, two quote unquote championship contenders <laughs> DNF'd. Can expect a Charles Leclerc DNF somewhere soon. But, <laughs> but uh, Perez and Sainz, they're both DNF, different reasons. Perez, he's, he's frankly gotten reckless. Um, lap one turn four he's gotten reckless and allegedly marco was coaching him <laughs> on not doing that uh, on lap one did it anyway there were consequences for that <laughs> sharp consequences another dnf uh, 
now Paris is essentially in the same situation as the Ferrari pair as far as challenging for the championship goes and I should probably mention um, Perez's bizarre qualifying penalty that was bizarre the stewards already missed the call so there's no call to be made thereafter it would be a different thing if I don't know he was impeding <laughs> he was impeding someone who qualified a who qualified 11th or something that would be a different thing but <laughs> this was all this was all uh, a whole session removed for a track limits violation I mean come on now the correct thing to do there was to see if he had set a faster time than that time with the track limits violation if he had then then well his position stays you don't penalize him after he qualifies fourth after they've put mileage on the engine already <laughs> but hey it's not it's not my problem is it was red bull's problem more specifically Perez's problem because red bull don't actually consider it a problem <laughs> i don't believe it's unprecedented i'm pretty sure it's happened somewhere before <laughs> pretty sure that, that type of penalty has happened somewhere before but it was otherwise just a very bizarre penalty um uh, left a bit of a bad taste in the mouth that one but hey i'm sure the stewards will have their reasons but otherwise it wasn't really the penalty that <laughs> it wasn't really that that qualifying penalty that moshed up Perez's race it was his own uh hot-headedness <laughs> on lap one that moshed up his race and really it's also it's likewise bizarre that that George Russell was penalized when he was the car on the inside anyway <laughs> it looked to me like um the car just understeered into the red bullet that's what it looked like to me what exactly you want him to do turn harder no, it was just gonna understeer more <laughs> Perez just should have been smarter not actually put his car out there or really hung it out wide to dry like <laughs> really put the car out there get some gravel on the tires as well and then you probably would have been safe to make that overtake but if he wasn't willing to do that, the overtake was never on. And it's perhaps too late to learn the lesson now at this point of the season. But otherwise, the lesson has been learned now. <laughs> Undoubtedly for Perez, the lesson has been learned now. And especially on account of there would have been other times over the Grand Prix to overtake George Russell. That wasn't, uh, that wasn't exactly the highest priority of overtakes. <laughs> really it just wasn't the highest priority of overtakes to get done they could have been done when drs was available and anything could have happened for Perez from there who knows i do think he would have just finished fourth but hey, who knows all right so the stewards have come into question over the course of this austrian grand prix one on account of well their uh <laughs> <laughs> They're very strange uh, penalty decisions uh, for qualifying. Two, for their handling of track limits in general over the weekend. And three, for how they've handled um, overtakes around the outside or the quote-unquote policing of overtakes around the outside. And uh, yeah, I suppose just get into it. So one, Perez. <laughs> Perez, he got penalized um, in qualifying. A bizarre penalty. Um, drops him down to 13th, I believe. Qualified 4th, I'm assuming they dropped him down. 10 or 9 positions and boom, you're now starting 13th for the Grand Prix. And, <laughs> well at least for the Sprint Grand Prix. And yeah, that was just a bizarre penalty. Like I've said, that was a bizarre penalty. Absolutely bizarre because, well, he had already lapped faster after the fact. And it was a legal lap, quote unquote. And two, the stewards had missed it. You know, you've already missed it by then. Like qualifying is a time sensitive thing. They've missed the call, so they don't get to make the call. That's what it should be on principle, but hey, here are the stewards, they'll play by their own rules. 
All right, and the stewards are different to the race director. The race director um, directs the rules of the race. Uh, the stewards direct the rules of, well, the drivers driving etiquette, essentially. So that's one. Some bizarre penalties for qualifying. There's probably some more, but the Perez one was bizarre enough, so. <laughs> the Perez one was w way bizarre enough. Um, two, penalizing drivers who are attempting to defend a position on the inside for a corner, which is very bizarre. Uh, Gasly got penalized for a vessel trying to overtake around the outside. Likewise, George Russell got penalized for Perez trying to overtake around the outside of him. And I suppose the precedent for that would go to when Albon was trying to overtake uh, Sir Lewis Hamilton around the outside. Someone should have told them back then. If you're taking the risk of putting your car on the outside in this, in this gravel trap <laughs> on the outside, then really it's only it's only your fault if it goes wrong. The driver who's gone on the outside, it's really only their fault. But oh, well, here we are in the brave new Formula One, I suppose, a brave new world type of Formula One here, where... <laughs> where it's safer to overtake around the outside because the stewards will protect you. It's very bizarre. And then there's the track limits violation. <laughs> then there's the track limits violations during the Grand Prix. That's bizarre. That's utterly bizarre. Just let the drivers race. Just let them race. Give them, I don't know, some... Give them a tally of what 10 or something <laughs> and you're not gonna count and you'll just add five seconds and you're not gonna alert them that you're counting and you'll just add five seconds to their race time after the fact like you'll just do something like that if you really want to penalize it but it's really pedantic to be oh well it's really pedantic to be thrown out black and white flag for track limits violent driving standards as they said it's really pedantic to be doing that I mean, if, if the track limits were so important, then you would just have the sausage curbs everywhere. Well, I suppose they probably don't want them everywhere because those, those things are dangerous. But if it was so important, you just put something similar to the sausage curbs everywhere. If track limits were so important, they would have just had a strip of gravel on the outside of every corner. It doesn't have to be a big strip, just, you know, a one meter strip of gravel running the length of the exit curb and that would solve all all track limits issues that would solve every track limits issue ever but then of course the moto gp would probably have a problem going around the circuit but anyway anyway the stewards want to um start policing things and it's it's problematic because well the stewards aren't actually a fixed position it's not a permanent hire so it's not a full-time no one is actually in a full-time job in that position and the stewards are always rotating Grand Prix, but Grand Prix by Grand Prix. So, will this be fixed? I doubt. We'll probably get a steward next weekend who doesn't care about track limits. He's like, oh, do what you want with track limits. Of course, there's a set of stewards. It's not just one steward that comes in. But who knows? You might just get the motley crew who say fuck, who just say fuck track limits and just let the drivers do what they want. Who you knows? Something might happen, but that would cause more. That would that would actually cause more problems after after this Red Bull Ring Grand Prix. But anyway, all right, the Orange Army has been humbled. They uh, came. They <laughs> they came stepping out with their flares and what have you. The orange flares. They they were going crazy with it, and they got humbled. Their guy didn't. Their guy wasn't able to seal the W. Likewise, they've done some shenanigans in the fan camps <laughs> over the course of the weekend. Uh, it's probably um, it's probably apt that, that they have been humbled come race day. No, of course I shouldn't paint the entire Orange Army with the brush of whatever happened in the fan camps, and I'm not particularly interested. The news reported on it, you know, your VIPs have had to come out and, and apologize for it, so it's happened. <laughs> 
right? Whether someone's got a, a, a theory of a psyop or what have you, it's happened. So the uh, so the VIPs have had to treat it as real. And now you see, this is the problem that is is undoubtedly going to emerge <laughs> with um, with F1 becoming more tribal. It's becoming very tribal F1 over the past few years. Before we were just watching, you know some very fast cars being raced and just appreciating that now it's now it's all about oh you know specific people need to win <laughs> or, or we aren't having a good time so everyone's become very tribal over the past few years and um well there's there's repercussions for that <laughs> like whatever's happened at this fan camp there are repercussions for that and so this is why i get um this is why I get kind of jaded with the webosphere. Because, well, the webosphere is, uh, <laughs> is unrestricted tribalism because, well, everyone's anonymous, so, ooh, gonna go full tribal on it. But because of that, um, it's pretty difficult to just discuss Formula One in general on the webosphere. Everything gets politicized one way or the other. And it's kind of become like like football. If if one said this it's kind of become like football. So I would just like the Orange Army, if anyone from the Orange Army is perhaps listening, who knows? <laughs> you know, who knows? But if anyone from the Orange Army is listening, get your man's under control. You know, because fuckery is gonna happen. If you know, if, if people just if people just pretend that, well, nothing's really out of order. Yet. And I mean, we can talk about the, the the cheering when Sir Lewis Hamilton crashes or whatever. Look, the crash is innocuous enough. You know, like having seen a whole lot of Formula One crashes, some of the worst open wheel crashes as well. A crash was wildly innocuous no one was no one was going to be hurt by that right <laughs> so so it's a bit of a muchness for me when i'm seeing people on the internet uh, getting up in a tizzy that oh the orange army was cheering when sir lewis hamilton crashed it's a bit of a muchness for me when 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 that's happening but that aside you know that that can just be gamesmanship that's fine that aside there are real repercussions to all the um uh to all the over politicization of certain events that go on in f1 because not everything is a political event you know there are very few and select things that are political events ideally for the technocrats who run the apparatus there are no political events in in the sports but sometimes they have to make the sports political and when people just don't let go of all the over politicization of the sports you end up with situations like uh, whatsoever happened in the fan camps that everyone's had to apologize for and due to the, the the amount of apologies that have come out from f1 vips it's safe to assume that whatever was reported from those fan camps that's that's the tip of the iceberg there's probably a lot more shit that gone down there right there'll probably be some whistleblowers talking about it somewhere on the internet who knows some people who are there <laughs> i'll probably be talking about it right now but otherwise the orange army got humbled all things considered you know there are repercussions for whatever off <laughs> Whatever off-circuit uh, antics the fan base wants to get into, there are repercussions for that. And yeah, quite frankly, I just wish that we wouldn't have to uh, we wouldn't have to be reading apologies from <laughs> from all the important people in F1 over stuff like this. That would be ideal for me. But who knows? Maybe some people just like drama. But otherwise, yeah, shit went down in the fan camps on accounts of, well, on accounts of as far as 
I'm concerned, uh, Verstappen fans being really foolish, considering <laughs> considering events that have transpired in recent history. All right, Alfa Romeo have stepped incorrectly, so it perhaps looks like the Bottas versus Mercedes narrative is going to be on hold. Well, maybe for the whole season. I'll tell you by Hungary if it's <laughs> if that narrative has simmered down completely. But on account of Alfa Romeo having stepped incorrectly on their upgrade path, their upgrades have not done quite what they were hoping for. Either that or their car is very uh, very moody on setup. <laughs> One or the other. Pick your poison. But on account of that, Alfa Romeo have found themselves slipping down. Uh, the pecking order. Still able to score points, but it's really on the back end of the point scorers now. As opposed to uh, challenging uh, Mercedes for their <laughs> for their spot in no man's land. Of course, I'm saying this and, you know, Alfa Romeo could all of a sudden, it could be Bottas versus Mercedes again at Paul Ricard. <laughs> you know, after I've said this, it could very well could be. I doubt it. But it very well could be. I'll definitely know by Hungary. Ideally, the Russian Grand Prix would still be somewhere on the calendar this season, but well, on account of whatever's going on in the world, that's not that's not a thing. Otherwise, I would definitely be able to. <laughs> I would definitely be able to say um, whether the Bottas versus Mercedes narrative is is on ice um, for the season. Because, well, one would expect Bottas to be very strong at the Russian Grand Prix. He's always, he always runs very strong there. <laughs> but another place he generally runs pretty well at is Hungary. So I'll tell you by Hungary if that narrative is on ice for the season or not. Otherwise, it does look like Alfa Romeo have stepped in correctly. Those um, relative performance charts they put up during free practice, they're the only team to have actually dropped pace <laughs> I'm assuming that's relative to every other team and not relative to their own pace because then they would just run the previous spec of car but I digress and one also wonders how those comparisons are even being made on, on different circuits but you know it's not asked too many questions <laughs> of, of, uh, of the stats providers but otherwise Alpha have definitely stepped incorrectly on their upgrade path whether that can be rectified with just a, a minor tweak here or there we'll have to see Paul Ricard is a good place to actually see where their car <laughs> actually is in the pecking order but otherwise they'll probably still be scoring good points for the rest of the season really I, I i struggle to see them not scoring points <laughs> perhaps not as consistently as early on in the season uh they are perhaps more susceptible to the plug and play nature of this formula <laughs> than they were earlier and they've undoubtedly fallen behind alpine in the pecking order on account of alpine's upgrades but anyway okay don't get too excited I'm probably gonna get excited. Oh, baby, Schumacher has arrived. Okay, he's the. He's the it looks like he's arrived after scoring, after breaking his duck, scoring his first points, breaking the glass ceiling, and all that. It looks like he's arrived now. Has he actually arrived? I don't particularly. I can't particularly say. I mean, he has had a good Grand Prix at Silverstone, so that's a circuit that every driver should actually. <laughs> every driver in the European scene should actually know and um, he's had a good race at the Red Bull Ring not exactly the most complicated circuit and it's a circuit that has undoubtedly benefited the Haas okay fair game now the question is well how long is this form going to be maintained that's the only question really and I hope it's maintained for a while. But what would be very, what would be very interesting? I would be very interested to actually just 
see how the F1 Webosphere responded in general if Mick Schumacher was to be beating, um, <laughs> not even beating, just be faster, you know, just consistently faster than Magnussen. I would very much like to see how the, well, just the, just how the whole Metasphere in general, really, in general reacts to that. I would very much like to see that. Will we get to see that? Can't really say. I am still wondering if <laughs> if I should hold off on um, actually uh, actually gauging baby Schumacher until next season. I am still pondering that thought in my head. <laughs> but otherwise, has he perhaps arrived? It looks like it. Does it not look like it? I mean, he was really turning the heat up on Magnuson. Well, firstly, throughout the sprint race, with a Sir Lewis Hamilton breathing down his back, he had a whole slobber knocker for contest with Sir Lewis Hamilton himself. <laughs> and he's gotten on the blow to, his, to the team, telling them to get Magnuson out the way, which is just uncanny. You know, it's like we stepped to the Twilight Zone or something. That was uncanny. Only one driver of the day. Now, that one was very interesting to me that he got driver of the day. I suppose he's just... <laughs> I suppose that Schumacher name is still quite the fan favorite. But otherwise, it looks like baby Schumacher has arrived. It looks like it. I gotta see what happens with him over, I don't know, perhaps the next four Grand Prix. Hopefully good tidings ahead for him, but we'll see what happens. Alright, time for some sundry observations. So one, there was more close racing. <laughs> some really ridiculous film. Uh, what laps was that? 23, 24, 25, I believe? The Joe, Alonso, Norris, that whole pack of that whole pack of cars that was that was some really fantastic film <laughs> that was some fantastic i would have loved to be at a very high vantage point of the circuit looking at that but otherwise i would hate to be at a part of uh, at a part of the circuit where i don't get to see all of that <laughs> that would be that would be annoying but otherwise there was more close racing last weekend at the austrian grand prix and oof, I don't really know what complaints folks could have about it. I mean, people are having complaints. Even Alonso is having complaints, saying, "Oh, <laughs> the regulations aren't doing, aren't doing what we wanted them to do." Well, the regulations are working exactly as intended. And you know, when I say exactly as intended, I'm not saying that the intention of the regulations was for Red Bull and Ferrari to be streaks ahead of everyone else. That wasn't the intention, but as far as the racing goes, quote-unquote racing, yeah, the regulations are working exactly as intended on that front. I would love to see what the racing looks like, I don't know, having let these regulations cook for five, maybe seven years, with some tweaks here and there. I'd love to see what the racing looks like then. Will we get to see that? I don't know, it remains to be seen. I hope so. I hope so. For me, the formula has already sold itself, but we'll see what happens. Next sundry observation, uh, the Tracing Martin evaluation is left one thing for me. Uh, it's, it's pretty annoying that, <laughs> it's pretty annoying for me that this Austrian um, Grand Prix was a sprint weekend. Because now I'm not actually getting to evaluate the car at a traditional circuit. Uh, with a standard qualifying and with the team being given setup time I'm not being able I'm not being given a, a spot to evaluate the car in that scenario and they'll probably have upgrades for for Paul Ricard so it's that's superfluous anyway really but otherwise on what the Tracy Martin has shown so far it looks like they've got a decent race car yes Vettel has gone full Spinella He's gone full Spinella in Austria, indeed. But otherwise, it does look like Tracing Martin have a good 
quote unquote racing car, a good car for Sundays. Doesn't look like they've it doesn't look like they've got a good qualifier. Actually, looks like they've got a poor qualifier, but I'll have my answer for that question come come Saturday in Paul Ricard. Then I'll have my answer to that question. But as things are right now, can't really evaluate the car in qualifying where the car has qualified while it's been wildly untraditional circuits. And not even where the car has qualified, where the car has finished really well. It's been wildly untraditional circuits. So thankfully, it is Paul Ricard next. Kind of get to evaluate everyone <laughs> cleanly. And uh, this Tracy Martin, it, it kind of intrigues me. Despite all my consternation about, well, the Tracing Martin project, as it were, the car does intrigue me. Next sundry observation, uh, Alpine are looking resurgent. Now, of course, they've brought other upgrades to the car, but the most notable for me is their rear wing. I actually think everyone needs to have that rear wing for next season, unless it gets outlawed. Would be very surprised it gets outlawed. But Alpine are looking very resurgent with whatever tech they've put on their car. Very resurgent. You know, Alonso, he's had to. He's had to put on a recovery drive. Uh, Ocon has just had to drive. It's gotten a good result. So the Alpine is a good package, as far as I'm concerned. It's a very good package. How good is it remains to be seen. I do think that they should have the quote unquote fourth fastest car on the grid locked out, Alpine. Whether Alonso will be lucky enough to um, let that be, be be shown or whether Archon will be consistent enough to let that be shown remains to be seen but otherwise looks like they've got a good package there and they've got they've got more money to blow than <laughs> than a few of the teams ahead of them and some of the teams around them but anyway we'll have to see what happens with Alpine especially at Paul Ricard. Paul Ricard Paul Ricard is oh, Paul Ricard is going to be a home race for Alpine actually, yeah. So that's that's functionally a home Grand Prix, but Paul Ricard is otherwise another quote unquote testing venue. So it will be interesting to see how every team performs at Paul Ricard, really, just to keep it simple. All right, and to close this video, uh, I'm going to talk about the budget caps being increased. Final sundry observation from this weekend. The budget caps were increased. I believe they were increased uh, by 4 million. So every team got 4 million added to their coffers. Um, if, it's, if it's not 4 million, <laughs> then it's 3 million. But otherwise, what exactly does this budget cap increase mean? Well, it really means nothing. You know, functionally it means nothing because the money will, the money will actually already be spent on on whatever logistical concerns the teams were peddling to Braun to have them do this, right? So, so the caps being increased shouldn't actually do anything. What's more, what's more impactful is actually the wind tunnel time rebalances that took place in Silverstone. And that's actually more impactful. How do those work? To my understanding, whatever the team's current um, constructors positions were at the time of Silverstone that dictated their new wind tunnel allocation time or wind tunnel and CFD I believe so Mercedes gained wind tunnel time Red Bull lost uh, Ferrari lost and the other teams you'd have to see relative to wherever they finished last season and where they were heading into Silverstone but that's far more impactful for me than the budget caps increase. The budget caps increase just means that <laughs> the budget cap increase just means that um, they're taking uh, <laughs> Joe Biden seriously when he says that um, the sanctions aren't going to drop for as long as it takes the Ukraine to win this war against Russia. That's all that that tells me. Likewise, that also tells me that, well, 
things are probably getting expensive <laughs> in the eurozone in the eurozone that's another thing that that tells me with the budget caps being increased things are probably getting a little too fucking expensive up north <laughs> It's worth three mil to the F1 teams, or well, four mil, you know, correct myself, whichever way that so falls. <laughs> it's worth that much to the F1 teams. How much is it worth to the people on the ground? Who knows? But I'll tell you what, if it gets to a point where they have to lose, uh, they have to increase the budget cap by 10 mil or something, if it, if it gets to that point, then I'll be very surprised if we're still running an F1 season, quite frankly. <laughs> I will be very surprised. I will also be very surprised if, well, if someone hasn't been assassinated or if World War Three hasn't started. <laughs> you know, it's one of those situations. So there's probably some uh, mystical number for, you know, the budget cap increase cap as it were <laughs> so let's say hmm, 10 mil uh, i could actually see them increasing it by 10 mil i think 12 mil if they were to increase the budget cap by 12 mil i think the world would be in oh that would be past crisis so we're probably in the end times by then i think if it so gets to 8 mil that yeah, we probably aren't really worrying about the F1 season if they increase the budget caps by that much. I mean, this probably plays on the canary in the coal mine idea and that now F1 is going to serve as the canary in the coal mine for <laughs> for how much uh, financial suffrage the people in Europe can actually tolerate as this whole Russia-Ukraine war uh, metastasizes and the whole sanction situation metastasizes and we're still experiencing a fallout from well economic fallout from the coup and lockdowns and what have you it is noteworthy that they've increased the budget caps i don't want people to assume that this means that oh you know teams are now going to spend this money on upgrades or something you gotta put those ideas aside for a second <laughs> Those ideas got to be put aside for a second, there's bigger things at play. And one of those bigger things at play is that, well, if it gets to a point where the, where the F1 teams <laughs> need a whole lot of money to be opened up to them just to complete the season, well, how much money needs to be opened up to the people for them to, com for them to complete the year? Anyone's guess. As for the governments to deal with. Uh, they might have to deal with that sooner than expected but anyway this has been the austrian sprint grand prix observations the orange army was humbled after some misbehavior <laughs> from a few of their ranks um science's engine detonated there was a grenade inside there <laughs> It wasn't actually a grenade inside there, but it looked like there was a grenade inside there. And, well, the rotating stewards has caused an issue. I should probably say in closing, if anyone wants to fix the rotating stewards issue, someone there in the FIA, you just hire some permanent stewards, that's all you do. You just hire some full-time stewards. You have a set of, I don't know, seven, eight, nine. It can be 10, so Ben 10 can have, you know, there's a smorgasbord to pick from for each Grand Prix. But yeah, you just hire however many you want, you, you fly three of them around for, well, you select three for each Grand Prix. And they all agree on a philosophy to actually, uh, to actually steward races by. And, and the problem is solved, done. It's a done deal. But hey, uh, there's far smarter people than anyone on the webosphere who are discussing this. Uh, mind you, this has been a problem for years, but eh, who's, who's counting at this point? <laughs> anyway, that's the vid. Peace. Hell breezy. Let me show you how to keep the dice rolling when you're doing that thing over there. Hey. 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 Hey.